It's a pleasure to introduce uh, a colleague and a friend from the statistics department uh, at UW here. Uh, so Emily has spent a long time at MIT uh, for her education. She's an undergrad there. She did her master's there and her PhD uh, in EECS. Her PhD was with Ellen Wilski. Uh, after that, she did a postdoc in statistics uh, at Duke with Mike West and David Dunson. Uh, and then after she finished her postdoc, she actually uh, spent a year at the Wharton School in uh, the statistics department where she occupied uh, my office. Uh, I left the year before. <laughs> and uh, then she jumped the gun and beat me to UW uh, the year after. And then she joined, uh, she joined us here. Uh, she has received uh, numerous awards, too many uh, to list. But some of them are the Sloan Fellowship, the ONR Young Investigator Award, NSF Career, uh, NSF Mathematical Sciences postdoc. Uh, her thesis was uh, also highly distingu distinguished, getting uh, the Savage Thesis Award in Applied Methodology. And she does a lot of fantastic work in uh, computational methods for uh, Bayesian dynamic models and time series. And she's going to talk about some of those uh, results with us today. Thanks, Sean. OK, so um, in this talk, I'm going to describe some of the work that my group's been doing in developing machine learning techniques for analyzing complex time series. And here I'm showing um, the students and postdocs, both past and present, that contributed to these projects. And I should me mention that Tianxi is actually Carlos's student, but an honorary group member. So I think the first thing that's important to emphasize is the fact that time series appear everywhere. And that statement is increasingly true based on new recording devices and platforms that have been developed. So for example, maybe we have streams of views or posts of users on these platforms, or maybe we have purchase histories of users on some set of e-commerce sites. Um, we also have lots of wearable devices that provide interesting activity data. And in the field of health, there have been lots of advances like electronic health records and different monitoring devices that allow us to start thinking about assessing the health state of patients over time. Um, and in my group, we've really been um, focused in on computational neuroscience. Um, and in that field, there have been a lot of advances in terms of devices that allow us to start um, analyzing really interesting activity happening in the brain. Um, so one device that we've looked at quite a lot is data from MEG. So a person sits in this chair um, and this chair has this helmet with all these spatially distributed sensors. Um, and these sensors provide um, recordings of the magnetic field induced by underlying brain activity. Um, so it's similar to fMRI, kind of, if you're familiar with fMRI. Um, but fMRI pr pr provides really good spatial resolution, but horrendous temporal resolution. So you can't really start doing proper time series analysis. Whereas here, we get pretty good spatial resolution but very good temporal resolution. So we can start analyzing activity in the brain over time. Another data set that we've looked at quite a lot is intracranial EEG. So these are where electrodes are embedded in the brain. And I'll skip fairly quickly over that gruesome picture. <laughs> Makes me rather queasy, but it's kind of requisite in that community. Um, so here, the idea is that electrodes are actually implanted in the brain. And not only do you have one channel of recording, but you have a whole collection of channels providing measurements of brain activity over time. And they're really um, a rich set of information about the relationships between um, the different channels of activity. OK, but when we're thinking about doing dynamical modeling, there's a number of challenges that we're faced with. One is the fact that the dynamics themselves can be really complex. So here, I'm showing this intracranial EEG data, just the start of a recording that we have. Um, and the coloring here is based on a model that we developed that allows us to parse these really complex dynamics into simpler dynamic behaviors. But overall, you can see it's a really complex process. Um, and so this is one of the challenges, which we'll label as just having complex dynamics. And a lot of my earlier work focused in on this challenge and thinking about how do you devise flexible models that allow the complexity of the learned model to adapt to the data that you've seen. And I gave a talk back on ideas related to this back in, I think it was 2012, a long time ago, especially in the history of most of you in this, this room. Um, but another challenge that we have, especially in a lot of these modern time series, is the fact that we just have a huge collection of data streams, where you can think of it as a highly multivariate process that we're observing. 
Um, so thinking about our MEG data, I said we have all these spatially distributed sensors. Not only do we have that dimensionality, but often what's done is you actually go from what's called this sensor space and you project onto a parcellation of the cortex. And that parcellation can have upwards of 10,000 regions that you're analyzing over time. Um, and this challenge of analyzing this high dimensional um, time series is only compounded by the fact that in some applications like MEG, you might only have very few observations from which you're trying to learn your models. Um, because like for um, in the MEG example, it's really costly to collect this data. So you're only gonna have a few examples of this person sitting in the chair and looking at the stimulus that you give them and then getting their brain recording. Okay, so a question is how do you start thinking about learning um, these really complex models in these high dimensional spaces from these few observations? So this is what we'll call a data scarcity challenge. On the other hand, you might have exactly the opposite challenge, which is you just have tons and tons and tons of data. This is a more classical notion of a big data challenge. We're here in this picture of this is the intracranial EEG data we showed before. This was just a snippet of time that we had. It was one episode of interest, one seizure that a patient um, was exhibiting, but there's a whole series of episodes that this person has. And this recording is really long because if you're gonna go and implant electrodes in somebody's brain, you're not about to rip them out the next minute. So you get these very, very long recordings. And a question is just how do you think about parsing through all this data? Um, so like I said, this is a more classical notion of a big data challenge. Um, and recently people have been talking about and trying to develop devices that are implanted in a person and provide a continual stream of data. So in those cases, we have to think about making our inferences on the fly. Okay, so um, my group's looked at different aspects of all of these challenges. Um, but in this talk, we're really gonna focus in on this idea of having these high dimensional data streams, um, but in data scarce sit situations. And the, what we're gonna look at is the question of how do we think about modeling the interactions between these data streams um, in these scenarios. Um, so the first project that I'm gonna describe was a project led by my past student, Shirley. So here, we're gonna imagine that we have this large collection of data streams, and we're gonna assume that out of all possible interactions amongst these data streams, only a sparse subset of these interactions are actually exhibited. Um, and to motivate this, let's look at an application of modeling a local level housing index. Um, and this is a collaboration that my group's had with Zillow for many years now. Um, and the goal here is to estimate the value of housing at these really local levels, like a census tract, and estimate how that value changes over time. Um, so policymakers, mortgage lenders, and of course consumers are interested in these types of housing indices. Um, but a challenge here is the fact that the data are spatiotemporally really, really sparse. So to get a sense of this, we can look at the following bar chart where what we see is that more than 40% of um, our census tracts in Seattle have fewer than three house sales on average per month, and more than 10% have fewer than one. So we can think about visualizing this a little bit more. Here's one census tract, and I'm showing house sales as these dots over time as the x-axis. Um, and our goal is to estimate this red curve, so the, the value in the census tract over time, as well as this red band of uncertainty about that. So here, the challenge doesn't look too hard, but here's a census tract where it might be hard to see from back there, but there are four house sales over a 17 year period. <laughs> Starts to look a little bit more challenging, right? Um, so clearly, if we look just at the data of that census tract, we're really gonna struggle to start estimating value in that tract, especially over time. So a question is, how can we start to tackle this problem? Well, what we're gonna do here is something that's very intuitive in this application. We're just gonna look to discover regions that behave similarly. Because if we can discover this type of structure, we can think about sharing information between the regions that we said are similar to improve our estimates. Um, and this is actually at a <laughs> level zero approximation what real estate agents do. Um, because if they're going to assess the value of your house, if there's no comp in your neighborhood, they're gonna go and look at neighborhoods that they believe are similar to your neighborhood and look at houses there. Um, so a question is how can we start to learn this kind of structure from the data? 
OK, so to start with, let's um, uh, discuss our dynamical model for just a single census tract. Um, so here, I'm showing the census tract that I live in. Um, and we're going to assume that there's some latent unobserved value in that census tract. That's the value we're trying to estimate. And we want to relate what the value is at time t to the value at time t plus 1. So a very simple model might just be a linear relationship. Uh, but of course, that's not a perfect model. There's really noise in this process. Um, so if we looked at what the value is in the tract at time t plus 1, given what it was at time t, if we could actually observe that, it wouldn't lie perfectly on this line. And the difference is what we call the innovation at time t. It's the randomness injected in this process that defines the stochasticity of, of this time series that we're looking at. Um, so in equations, what we're saying is that the value at time t in census tract i, just a linear function of the value at the previous time step, plus some innovation. Um, but of course, we don't actually observe this latent value. Instead, we observe house sales prices. Um, and so we're going to assume that the elf house sale in tract i at time t um, is just a noisy version of the value in the census tract at time t corrected for by house level features like square footage, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and so on. Um, and there's also other things in this model that we're bearing, like the fact that um, we model a global overall non-stationary trend to what's happening in Seattle as a whole, as well as seasonality. Um, but what we're interested in is the deviations from this kind of common global structure, and then looking at relationships between regions in those deviations. Okay, so you can think of this model, if you're familiar with these types of representations, as what's called a discrete time linear Gaussian state space model, where in our case, at some time points, we have multiple observations, multiple house sales, and at other time points, and many of these, we have no house sales. Okay, but we don't have just a single census tract, we have a whole collection of census tracts. And for each one of these census tracts, there's an innovation at every time point driving this process. And instead of modeling these innovations as being independent across census tracts, which would imply that the census tracts are evolving completely independently, we're going to stack them up into a big p-dimensional vector where we're assuming we have p-different census tracts or regions that we're looking at, and assume a big joint distribution on this vector. Uh, in particular, we're looking at a Gaussian distribution with covariance matrix sigma. So sigma is capturing all the correlations between these different regions. But a question is, what's the structure on sigma? Because both statistically, because of lack of observations, and computationally, we can't handle a full covariance matrix in our model. So what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to assume a block diagonal structure for sigma. Because then what that means is that if two census tracts fall into the same block, then they'll have correlated innovations. And if they fall into different blocks, they'll have independent innovations. So if I shove this innovations vector through our dynamical model, we get out exactly these clusters of correlated time series. And I want to highlight that this is a very different notion of clustering time series than what's typically done out there. Typically, people look at the observed process and look at similarities in the observed process. That breaks down when you have lots of missing data like we do in our application. But in addition, what we're doing here is we're looking at a latent process, an unobserved process, and looking at correlation structure in that unobserved process. So two regions will fall in the same cluster if they're correlated, which me could mean that one trend is going up while the other one is going down. So it's just an inherently different notion of clustering time series. OK, well, the challenge here boils down to the fact that we don't know what this clustering structure is. That's what we're trying to discover from data. Um, so that corresponds to the fact that we don't know how many blocks there are in this block diagonal matrix. We don't know the size of each of these blocks. And we also don't know the ordering of the census tracts in this vector to give us this nice block diagonal form. Um, so to solve this problem, we're going to use something called a latent factor model combined with Bayesian nonparametrics, but I'm not going to go into the details here. So we looked at City of Seattle data, and there are 140 census tracts, um, and we looked at 17 years of data. Um, and over that time period, there were over 125,000 transactions. Um, and this, what this map shows here is Seattle broken down into census tracts, and the color of each region indicates the cluster assignment, uh, what we inferred as the cluster for that region. Um, and so you see that we've inferred 16 different clusters. And if the picture were on the left here, what you would see is for each one of those clusters, 
what the average dynamics are over time relative to the global um, trend in Seattle. And what you would also see is that for this cluster corresponding to the downtown region, you see the largest bust and boom over this period, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and there's lots of other intuitive structure that unfortunately I can't point to. But um, not only can we do those types of quantitative, qualitative analyses, we can also do something more quantitative. Um, in particular, we can look at predicting held out house sales. Um, and I want to emphasize that our goal isn't actually predicting house sales. If that were the goal, I'd use a much fancier regression model. Um, but we can use it as a proxy for assessing um, the performance of our index. And in particular, what we did was we compared the performance um, of our method against the industry standard Case-Shiller index. Um, and we're looking at two different metrics of predictive performance. And this plot shows percent improvement of our predictions over that of Case-Shiller. And we've broken down our analyses into the 5% of census tracts with the most number of observations, middle 50 percent and then the 5% with the fewest number of observations. And not surprisingly, um, the place where we have largest improvement, we have improvement across the board, but where we have the largest improvement are the census tracts that have few observations. Because these are the ones where discovering this structure, this clustering structure and sharing information is so helpful. Um, well, when Zillow gave us this problem, they wanted us to start looking at census tracts because um, in that world, census tracts are very fine scale, and existing um, housing indices can't scale down to census tract levels. So we devised this model. We looked at this performance. It seemed pretty good. And then um, my student Shirley did an internship at Zillow and looked at ways of defining what they call smart neighborhoods, which are these neighborhoods that are at an even finer scale than census tracts. Um, and they ended up corresponding to a lot of the neighborhoods that we know and love around Seattle. Um, and they capture even more of the spatially heterogeneous structure that's um, inherent to housing. And what we saw here is even though the data scarcity problem is even worse at this finer scale, we ended up seeing an improvement in our predictive performance. And that's because census tracts can actually smooth over the spatial heterogeneity. But existing um, housing indices, the performance gets worse and worse as you get to these finer scales because of the way the indices are formed. Um, and the data scarcity really starts providing really poor estimates um, in these methods. So this was um, exciting and showed that we're indeed able to robustly handle data scarce situations. OK, so this was one notion of thinking about handling high dimensional um, time series and data scarce situations. Um, it was this really simple um, notion of just discovering clusters of time series where within a cluster, there are correlations, and between clusters, things evolve completely independently. And we got at this structure by um, looking at sparsity in the covariance matrix. So these um, correspond to statements of what are called marginal independence. Um, but this is a rather strict assumption because no matter what data set you have, there's always going to be some residual correlations amongst everything in your, your set. Um, so often people look at um, other notions of um, how to capture relationships in these high dimensional settings, like um, looking at statements of conditional independence instead of marginal independence. Um, and in the world of Gaussian random variables, these conditional independencies are captured by zeros in the inverse covariance matrix. So this is sparsity in the inverse instead of the covariance itself. Um, and so um, these conditional independencies are described by graphical models. Um, and another approach that you can take is assuming that your covariance has some low rank structure. And this is equivalent to assuming that your high dimensional observations have some description in terms of some low dimensional subspace. Um, so we're going to talk about these types of approaches, but in the context of dynamical models. Um, so to start with, let's talk about these graphical models. Um, so what we like to do is we'd like to be able to in infer statements of conditional independence between entire time courses. Um, and this was a project led by Alex and Nick. OK, so for this, um, our motivation came from this MEG data that I mentioned earlier in the talk, where here um, our goal was to infer what are called functional connectivity networks. So these are networks in the brain 
um, that are described by conditional independencies between activity in different brain regions. So people think about using graphical models to try and represent these functional connectivity networks. Um, but typically when people are talking about graphical models, they're talking about graphical models in terms of collections of IID random variables. Um, so just as a little bit of background, if you have a collection of Gaussian distributed IID random variables, um, then if you look at the inverse covariance, like we said, the zeros in that inverse covariance encode this graph structure, these statements of conditional independence, where, for example, here, if there's no edge between random variables x1 and x2, that means that those variables are conditionally independent given x3, x4, and x5. And we see this from the fact that there's a zero in the 1, 2 entry of this inverse covariance. OK, but we don't have collections of IID random variables. We have collections of time series. Um, and what we'd like to do are encode statements of conditional independencies between these entire time courses. Um, and so these graphical models of time series are going to account for um, interactions at any possible lag. And for the sake of this talk, we're going to assume Gaussian stationary processes. So it's just the direct analog of thinking about Gaussian random variables. OK, so how are we going to think about learning this structure from data? One approach might be to just stack up the t time points we observe from each one of our p different time series into a big vector. And then we know that this vector is normally distributed with this big covariance matrix. I'm going to call it sigma sub tp, number of time steps per time series and p time series that we're looking at. Um, and then if you, you could think about doing fairly standard Gaussian graphical model structure learning approaches. But the issue here is the fact that each step of the learning algorithm is going to have complexity order t cubed, p cubed. OK, so clearly this doesn't represent a good time series approach, scales really poorly with time. So instead, what we're going to show is really useful is transforming our data from the time domain into the frequency domain. For example, using a fast Fourier transform. Um, and then instead of talking about lagged covariance matrices, which define the underlying stochastic processes we're, we're looking at, or stationary processes, um, we're going to look at their frequency domain analog, which are called spectral density matrices. This is the, the key thing. So these spectral density matrices, um, there's one defined for each frequency, minus pi to pi, and it's a complex valued matrix. And a question is, what conditions on the spectral density matrix lead to insights about conditional independencies? Because if you remember, for Gaussian IID random variables, we looked at the inverse covariance matrix, and the zeros of that matrix defined our graph structure. Well, there's this nice result by Dollhouse in 2000 that says for Gaussian stationary processes, if we look at the inverse spectral density matrix and look at the zeros that are consistent across frequencies, those are the zeros that define this graph of time series. So this is really nice because it allows us to start thinking about our time series in the frequency domain in very similar ways to how we think about Gaussian IID random variables. OK, so Dollhouse gives us these conditions for identifying conditional independencies um, from the spectral density matrices. But a question is, how are we going to learn this structure from data? So these spectral density matrices are the parameters of our model. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take a likelihood-based approach. So somehow we need to relate the data um, to these parameters. And then we're also going to take a Bayesian approach and place priors on these parameters. So in particular, we're going to place a prior over graph structures. And then what we're going to do is, based on representing our time series in the frequency domain, we can write down what's called the Whittle likelihood approximation of our Fourier coefficients, so our representation in our frequency domain, given our spectral density matrices. And the nice thing is the fact that this likelihood decouples across frequencies. So now, instead of being hit by that OT cubed, P cubed operation, every step of our learning algorithm is OT, P cubed. So if you have a 1,000 length time series, six orders of magnitude reduction in complexity here. OK, but it sounded really exciting. But then you have to think one step further, which is if I had to do inference, 
over all these complex valued spectral density matrices, these are big, ugly matrices, you'd really be out of luck. Um, so instead, what we'd like to do is define something called a conjugate prior. You don't need to know what that is other than what it allows us to do is analytically marginalize all those parameters and condition just on the graph structure itself. Um, unfortunately, conjugate prior didn't exist in this case, but luckily Alex was able to define one, and we call it the complex hyper inverse Wishart distribution. Um, but the key thing is it allows us to analytically compute the margin, what's called the marginal likelihood of our data just given the graph structure. So together, these two components allow us um, to have a tractable form for our belief about the graph structure just conditioned on our observed data. So we can think of this as a graph score. You give me a graph structure, and I can score it based on my observed data. You give me another graph structure, I can score it as well. So the cool thing is this allows us to use existing graph search algorithms to start doing structure search on graphs of time series. All we have to do is take the line where they define um, the graph score and replace it with our graph score. So any developments made algorithmically for doing structure search on uh, graphical models, we can use directly. And so we did exactly this. We took a stochastic search algorithm that existed before, replaced that line that defined the graph score with our graph score, and applied it to our problems. OK, so the first data set that we looked at was actually a collection of global stock indices. Our interests really are in the MEG data, but things are a lot more intuitive to describe here. Um, so we looked at daily returns from each of these different countries. And if we treat those daily returns as IID, then you get these really dense and hard to interpret graphs. But if you run exactly the same code, just with that different definition of graph score, then you get these much more interpretable structures. So here, for example, we see this strong Eurozone UK cluster. And then if you look up here, there's US, Canada, Hong Kong, Australia, Japan hanging off of Australia. Lots of reasons we'd see this type of structure. Um, so the key thing here is that by leveraging the fact that there's temporal dependencies present in our data, we get much more interpretability out. And we're not actually specifying what the dynamical model is. We're just saying that some Gaussian stationary process underlies our data. OK, but I do want to get to this idea of learning functional connectivity from MEG. Um, so in our case, we were looking at an auditory attention task where a person was asked to either maintain their attention or switch their attention um, with four different stimuli, just a left, right, high, or low pitch. Um, and then based on this, we got activation patterns over time in brain activity. Um, and the goal here is to understand what are networks activated in the brain when somebody is asked to switch their attention rather than maintain their attention. Because for some people, it's actually very hard to do this auditory switching. And so we're interested in just describing what is the typical network, brain network, look like for switching tasks so we can start to understand um, different categories of people who have deficits in terms of um, doing this auditory switching. OK, so there were eight different scenarios, either maintain or switch in each of four different stimuli. So we applied our graphs of time series to each one of these. And what I'm showing here are the intersection of the edges learned in both the switch and maintain tasks. Um, and on the bottom, what I'm showing, in each one of these colored regions is a different region of interest in the brain, and it's ordered around the circle based on anatomical proximity in the cortex. Um, but on the bottom plot, in red, I'm showing edges that appeared in the switching networks, but not the maintain, and black is vice versa. And we stared at these pictures, and we started seeing lots of patterns, and I could start describing to you. But we went to our collaborator, and we were kind of excited and we said, look, is this structure meaningful? Do you expect to see these kind of things in auditory switching networks? And we truly were really excited. And he, we were quickly deflated, though, I have to say. Because he looked at these. So this is Casey Lee. Um, and so he's here on campus running a really cool MEG center. Um, and he said, we just don't expect networks this dense. Maybe a few of these edges make sense, but a lot is just, yeah, not, not, not really what I was hoping would come out of this. So we thought and thought 
And we thought, well, okay, they expect sparsity. We're getting out things that are too dense. What could be causing this? Um, and one thing that um, can cause this is if there's the presence of unobserved latent variables um, that are interacting with your observed variables. So maybe you have sparsity um, amongst your observed variables, but then there are some latent variables that interact densely with your observed variables so that if you don't actually observe those variables, the induced interactions make it look as if they're dense interactions amongst your observed variables. So a question is, how can you disentangle the structure? Um, so people have looked at this in the case of IID data. Um, so in particular, if you think about Gaussian IID random variables again, um, and if we look at what we'll call the full covariance matrix, the covariance matrix over all our observed variables and latent variables, and look at its inverse, then this red block, the zeros in that red block are describing the graph structure, the sparsity that defines these blue edges amongst our, our observed variables. And then this yellow block here are describing these dense interactions between our latent variables and our observed variables. But when we think of this marginal structure, we look at this marginal inverse covariance matrix, what we end up with is this sparse term, but we also have this low rank term. And it's low rank if you assume that the number of latent variables is much smaller than your number of observed variables. Um, and I think I forgot to mention, I'm looking right at Rahul as I'm describing this part, that this, this part of this project was led by Rahul and Nick. Um, and so, um, the overall structure here, when you combine the sparse and low rank, um, these sparse and low rank components, is something that's dense. And so as a result, um, that's, that's why you get these dense networks and lose um, this ideal sparse structure you would have just on the observed variables if you accounted for the latent variables. So the question is, how can we disentangle this? Um, and what we're going to do, so what's been proposed before, this isn't our work here, um, is to just write your inverse covariance matrix as the sum of two parts. One is this matrix psi, which we hope to, to be sparse. And then there's this other matrix L that we expect to be low rank if there's only a few latent variables. And so what's been proposed is a penalized likelihood approach where you think about, you can write down the likelihood. You don't need to understand the form of this. Um, but instead of just minimizing this negative log likelihood in an unconstrained fashion, you want to minimize it with respect to this psi and L matrices, encouraging psi to be sparse and L to be low rank. So what we're going to do um, is add a sparsity penalty, just like in lasso regression, if you're familiar with that. Um, and then you also add this, what's called a trace norm penalty. So it's a convex surrogate for the rank function. Um, and this is going to encourage L to be low rank. Um, so overall, this is a convex program. And so that's really nice, because it allows you to bring to bear all the nice convex algorithms and theory associated with convex optimization to this problem. OK, but a question is, how are we going to apply these types of ideas to our graphs of time series? Um, first, in our case, instead of thinking about adding latent variables, we're thinking about adding latent processes. Um, and also, instead of having just an inverse covariance matrix, we have these inverse spectral density matrices across frequencies, and there's coupling across frequency, because the zeros that are consistent across the frequencies are what define our graph structure. Um, so we can also write down the likelihood um, under this decomposition. And this is this Whittle likelihood I mentioned before. Um, and here, we're going to add a sparsity penalty. But here, we're going to use something called a group lasso penalty. And this is going to encourage zeros across frequencies. And then we're also going to add this low rank penalty per frequency. Um, OK, so overall, this is still a convex objective. And um, so we derived ADMM and complex proximal gradient algorithms. Um, I want to highlight that typically when somebody's doing proximal gradient, it's with respect to real valued matrices or parameters. Um, here, we're taking gradients with respect to these complex valued matrices, which is not as straightforward as you would imagine and kept Rahul and Nick quite busy this summer. OK. Um, but applying these types of methods to our data, we end up seeing that we get more, um, we get sparser and more interpretable graphs 
Um, so of course, if we look at synthetic data where we know that there are latent processes present interacting with our observed processes, what we're showing here is that relative to a method that ignores those latent processes, this is showing detection performance, that our method dramatically outperforms in terms of detecting the graph structure. Um, but our main focus, of course, is on this MEG data. And what we see now is that we get much sparser and more interpretable graphs. So we showed these networks to our collaborator. And this time, we finally got that response we were <laughs> hoping for the first time, which was a lot of excitement. For example, he got very excited about this RTPJ region appearing here. That's known to be associated with auditory switching tasks. Um, you also see this, there's a region AUD, which is part of the auditory processing system, and FEF, which is part of the visual processing system. And you see those regions activated both in the maintain and switch tasks, which makes sense because the stimuli presented are both auditory and visual. So there's lots of really um, interesting and intuitive structure here. Um, and um, actually some edges that our collaborator is interested in exploring further. OK, so I also want to give a very, very quick tour into this idea of using low dimensional embeddings of our high dimensional processes. Um, so the idea here is that you're observing time series in this high dimensional space, but you're assuming that um, that time series can really be described as a weighted collection of some latent processes involving a, in a low dimensional subspace. Um, and so our groups looked at this idea in different contexts, but I just want to describe the latest project that we've had going on in this area, um, which is work that Chris has been leading with Alex. Um, so the goal here is to provide these long-term forecasts of demand for products. So you might imagine that you want to stock some set of products, and so you need to make these inventory decisions well in advance. So you really need true long-range forecasts. So maybe you have skis and ski jackets that are purchased more in winter months, roasting pans purchased more around holidays, um, and maybe running shoes and car seats um, don't have much of a seasonal trend. OK, so we can think about plotting the demand for these products over time. Um, and there are a number of challenges we're faced with. One is the fact that we might have a new product um, that we've never seen before. How do we think about making forecasts of demands when we have no history in this case. So this is referred to as the cold start problem. Um, another challenge, of course, is we have missing data in our data structure. Um, and finally, we'd like to make these long range forecasts that I mentioned. And these are all situations in which classical time series methods start to break down. Um, and because our goal are these long range forecasts, we really want to emphasize the seasonal patterns that we're seeing again and again, repeated over periods such as over um, a year, um, because it's that kind of structure that allows us to make more reliable long-term forecasts. So for simplicity, we're just going to chop up this process over this period um, and stack these series up as columns um, in this matrix. So we're thinking of every observed year of a product as if it were, in essence, like a new product. Um, so our goal here really boils down to just basically filling in missing data in this array. So you could think of using matrix factorization approaches um, to solve this problem. That vanilla matrix factorization really only gets you so far. Because when we have entire columns missing, which represents either a new product or a new year of an existing product, the optimization objective that you'd write down for matrix factorization, the vanilla matrix factorization, leads you to predict zero for these products. So clearly, you'd hope to do better than that. If I get a new ski jacket, I don't want to predict that there's going to be zero demand for this. I, I already have skis in my inventory. I know I've had these skis for years. I know the patterns of what people purchase these skis, how people purchase these skis. Can't I do better than just predicting zero? Well, yes. If you assume that you have other features associated with your product, so let's say just a product description, then maybe I can look at these features and features of the other products I've seen and use that to improve my predictions. Um, so you can think about doing what's called featureized matrix factorization, where you take these features associated with each of these products and add this to the prediction. Um, but this featureized matrix factorization also only gets you so far, because we're going to assume that our features are really high dimensional. So this weightings matrix on these features is this massive set of parameters. 
So we're going to make yet another low rank approximation here. So here are two notions of these low rank approximations coming in. Um, so using this type of approach, uh, we looked at analyzing some Wikipedia data. We looked at 4,500 of the most popular Wikipedia pages and looked at page traffic over a six year period. Um, and for the features for each of these pages, we just looked at the article summary, which for most articles is just a couple paragraphs of text. And a question we have here is whether we can forecast the traffic for a page before the page even launches, just from its first few paragraphs of text. And what we've shown in some initial studies, and this is very heavily ongoing work, is that there is definitely hope for these methods. It's pretty amazing what comes out. Here are two held out articles that we had. Um, and so this is the actual um, traffic for these pages over an entire year. And here's our prediction without ever having seen the demand for these articles. So the idea here is that even though our data live in this high dimensional space, there's this repeated structure. There's really this low rank structure. And we're utilizing this in a couple ways to get these, these forecasts. OK. Um, so throughout this talk, I've described different ways to think about handling high dimensional time series um, in data scare situations by leveraging these sparse and low rank um, structures. And we saw really the impact that these types of structures can have in a lot of different applications. But of course, to actually see that impact, the algorithms we're using are really crucial. Um, so another really big push in my group has been on algorithmic development. And I'm going to give just a very, very little seasoning high level <laughs> overview of this um, in five minutes, probably. The first project I want to mention is work that was done um, with Tian Chi and Yin. Um, and this was an idea of how to be Bayesian but not wait a lifetime or longer to get results. Because if you guys have ever used a Bayesian model, you know that it doesn't take much data or much complexity to that model for computations to become just a huge, huge bottleneck. Um, so a really popular tool for Bayesian inference is something called Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and the idea is that there's this posterior distribution that you want to characterize, and you're going to characterize it through simulation, through exploring this distribution. And one technique of, of doing this is Metropolis Hastings. And I'm going to play a video that Carlos hates and I like. Um, and this video is just a nice illustration of these methods. So here there are a whole bunch of different distributions that spell out Harlem Shake. So these are 2D distributions. Um, and these red dots are Metropolis Hastings walking along and exploring these distributions. OK? really slow. But now there's this other method called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that use, uses physical dynamics to explore the contours of these distributions. And it's exploring these contours much more rapidly. So Hamiltonian Monte Carlo was actually proposed many, many years ago before I think even I was born, we'll have to see. Um, and, <laughs> but only recently, it's really, really gained in popularity, as you can see from the fact that this video even exists. And if you could hear the music, you would hear Harlem Shakes in the background. So the fact that somebody even put time into making this video hopefully gives you a sense of how excited people got about these methods. And you can watch that video again on YouTube if you like it as much as I like it. <laughs> um, OK. Um, but as a result, there's been an explosion of HMC-like algorithms, much longer than the list of acronyms I'm putting here. Um, and we actually contributed to this hysteria back in 2014, um, providing a stochastic gradient version of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that allows us to truly handle very large and streaming data sets. Um, but as Tianchi can attest to, the proofs are really, really hard. And the reason is because if you think about the space of all possible continuous Markov processes you could use for sampling, exploring these distributions, only a small subset of those are actually sampling from the right distribution. And it's really, really hard to prove that the dynamics that you're specifying fall in that class. Um, but luckily, Ian came along and had this really great idea of how to define the stochastic differential equation in terms of just two matrices, D and Q. And no matter what D and Q you give me, I know I'm going to be sampling from the right distribution. Another cool thing is all those algorithms I listed on the previous slide 
have a D and Q in our representation. They fall into this framework. But more impressively, actually any valid sampler has a representation in this framework. So you guys can stop writing all these papers about um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo-like algorithms because as you're exploring the space of Ds and Qs, the work is done. You know that you're exploring the space of all valid samplers. For those of you who like stochastic differential equations, which might be two or three of us in here, um, I wanted to write this down. But really, the main reason I wanted to write it down is to show that it really actually is not that complicated. Uh, you just give me a pop. <laughs> Maybe. OK, as I get booed off the <laughs> OK. But any um, positive semi-definite D, skew symmetric Q, um, Ian's proven that you're sampling from the right distribution. So that's cool. And the other cool thing is that using the methods Tianxi developed for stochastic gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you can apply them directly to any sampler in this class. So you can devise scalable versions of any of these samplers now. OK. But I felt I would be want to leave out the fact that, given the fact it's a time series talk, these types of stochastic gradient methods that I keep alluding to really aren't great at being directly applied to time series. And this is work I did with Nick, Jason, and Dylan. Um, and so we were looking at a human chromatin segmentation task where um, you can think about segmenting this sequence just using a very simple time series model called a hidden Markov model, or HMM. Um, but the issue is the fact that there are 250 million locations across this sequence. And the learning algorithms associated with HMMs have to do full passes through the data set for every little update to your parameters. Um, so it's just computationally infeasible in these data sets. So instead, what people tend to do is they tend to just divide the data set up into manageable segments and analyze each one independently. A slightly smarter approach is to treat these little segments as mini batches within a stochastic gradient algorithm. But the issue is, and what we studied, is the fact that as you're dividing into mini batches, you're breaking crucial dependencies in your time series. And so we studied a way to account for these broken dependencies within these types of stochastic gradient algorithms. Um, so this led to state-of-the-art performance in terms of um, this chromatin segmentation task and a runtime of just an hour. Whereas in contrast, um, previous approaches looked at more complicated dynamical models than just the vanilla HMM that we used, but did this naive approach of analyzing things separately and took days to run. So this is one of those cute examples of how sometimes you can get away with simpler models if it allows you to coherently use all your data. OK, so perfect. <laughs> so um, in summary, we looked at how these sparse and low rank models allow us to have improved prediction, interpretability, and scalability, and how, of course, performance can be aided by clever algorithmic, algorithmic tricks. Um, and we demonstrated the impact in many different time series domains. And you might think this is the end of the talk, and Hank is holding his breath, but there's more. <laughs> yes, there's more. <laughs> um, I did want to spend the last couple minutes just mentioning something that's actually been um, basically my primary focus over the last year and a half, which is the development of this machine learning specialization on Coursera. Um, this is something I've been doing with Carlos. And if you ask us why, we were afraid couples counselors were going out of business and <laughs> wanted to support that sector. No. Um, more seriously, this is something that's been a really exciting um, and, as cheesy as it sounds, truly rewarding experience. Um, so this specialization consists of six different courses. Uh, but we're taking a fundamentally different approach to teaching machine learning. Typically, classes start by saying, oh, here's a coin flip, and then eventually building up to something that might actually be useful. It takes a lot of time to get there, a lot of math, um, and a lot of background. But instead, we're assuming that students have very, very little background coming into the courses. And we're taking what um, we call a case studies approach. Uh, which was actually motivated by my time at Wharton, so <laughs> not just sitting in Shams' office. Um, and so um, the idea is that you have some real-world applications. We look at Zillow data and trying to predict the value of a house. We look at uh, reviews of restaurants and trying to predict whether it's a positive or negative sentiment just based on the text of those reviews. So we look at real and intuitive examples, and we motivate all the methods that we teach in the courses from these data sets 
and the learners actually use these data sets as they're going through the courses. so they actually get to see how what they're learning can have impact in these real domains. um so we've launched four of the classes so far, and we have two more to go. um but one thing i wanted to highlight is actually our completion rate um and there aren't great statistics for this. i saw a couple of studies out there but our completion rate is at least twice that of um a typical stem class um so that's really speaking to the fact that the methods we're using are engaging learners to go to completion in these courses um and if you look at the learners they really are coming from all over the world um and if you dig into the demographics there's some that i don't like that much like this one right here and i'd really like to work on the number of uh female learners in the course and that's something i plan to do um but i wanted to highlight a few demographics that speak to the fact that our learners really don't look like typical university students um the age group is much higher um and also if you can see the number 64% of our learners are employed full time 10% are unemployed and looking for a job um and so these things make us think that these learners really are trying to gain a skill to transition in their current career or possibly find a new career um and also a lot of our learners um don't have any type of four year degree um so the content from that um specialization i'm going to be translating into an undergrad non majors machine learning course to be offered next winter winter 2018 um and so in summary i just want to say that clearly i really like models and algorithms for time series but i'm also very passionate about machine learning education okay thank you in the context of having lots of interaction with NLP people over the years but not something I've worked on directly but yeah there there are people who use really interesting models that have these types of flavors to start analyzing that data so yeah It's a naive question I'm more curious if there are settings or if it's interesting mathematically where you might have a two time series or a set of time series that aren't correlated except that there's correlation between like garbage values you know sometimes there's just noisy data and it might be that at certain time steps everything's garbage even if otherwise the series are independent is that an interesting question it is i mean yeah <laughs> i think that, so i i like you see this in well i'd imagine you'd see this in terms of like failure domains of things like there's systems running and then power goes down and you know and so definitely i mean in terms of anomaly detection in terms of system failures power usage of things you do get the um whether it's correlated yeah you do get this I, i think there are a lot of applications that are interesting to study where you get this very rare event that triggers this kind of widespread either junk everywhere kind of garbage correlation structure and that's very interesting to think about yeah I shared one last question. So, uh you, you know, well it doesn't come up too much in many of the technological applications. So one of the reasons people care about these Bayesian methods are conferences and and in your predictions and yeah. predicting the scientific domains and you didn't mention any of them the applications you did but I'm wondering if you have comments yeah. as to where you find it to be useful. So where we find that we to find be that? useful? Yeah, basically. Yeah, so I mean there there are lots of i i could go on and on and on i don't know if people really want to hear this but um so yeah in a lot of predictions you want instead of just having a point estimate lots of practitioners are interested in the uncertainty about those predictions especially in fields like computational neuroscience if you're going to go experiment on someone and design an experiment you sure want to know what your uncertainty about the structure is um if you're thinking about anytime there's a decision making process involved uncertainty is just so crucial 
Um, and I, you're, you're completely right. I kind of bury that under the rug. That's one of the things that Bayesian methods give you that other methods don't as directly. Um, and one of the hard things is the fact that the question is, how much do you trust your measure of uncertainty? And that gets into questions of algorithms. So that's been something that my group's really been putting effort into is the fact that, unfortunately, so Bayesian methods, in theory, give you this really nice um, framework for looking at uncertainty and capturing that uncertainty. But in practice, the algorithms end up getting stuck in your measure of uncertainty is not really probably what the true uncertainty is. And so that's why we've been putting a big emphasis on trying to scale those algorithms really to the data sets and the types of models we're interested in. So, yeah. Well, let's uh, thank Emily again. Mm -hmm.